All right. Um, so I'm really glad to be back here first off. Uh, you know, doing an in-person presentation, in-person conferences has been so long, and it's, it's one of those things I never thought I'd miss until it was um, taken away. So I'm just really glad to be here. I'm actually going to take off the mask for a bit. Um, a lot easier to talk. Um, and I'm happy to be here talking about this subject, uh, managing Kubernetes webhooks. Uh, webhooks have been um, kind of a thorn on my side. I'm sure a lot of others uh, manage them in Kubernetes. Uh, comes with a lot of challenges, and, and uh, we've been able to use Spire uh, to make the webhook process a lot easier. Uh, so I'm Faisal Lemon. I'm a software engineer at F5 Networks. Uh, previously, I worked at Nginx, and Nginx was acquired uh, by F5. Nginx, of course, is the open source web server uh, load balancer uh, solution that a lot of you guys are familiar with and, and I'm sure um, are using in your deployments. Um, the picture there, of course, is my daughter, uh, Salma, and our cat, Marley. Uh, we just recently adopted her about six months ago. Uh, very uh, naughty little cat, uh, but a lot of fun. She likes jumping on shoulders, so we think she was a parrot in the previous life. Uh, so the agenda for today is I'm just going to talk a little bit about the challenges of, of webhooks, um, just to set this, the table, um, and then digging into how we use Spire uh, to solve those challenges, and then um, some Q&A as well after that. Uh, so let's go ahead and dig into it. So a little bit of a refresher on the webhook side. So first off, what is a webhook? Uh, so in the world of Kubernetes, a webhook is a callback. Um, and it runs uh, before Kubernetes objects are created, updated, deleted. So any sort of modification of the Kubernetes state, uh, a webhook runs. And then once that webhook runs, you have the opportunity to do something. Um, and so what is that something that you can do? And they typically fall into these two buckets, um, the two types of webhooks. The first one I have listed here is a validating webhook. Uh, and that is used to, as it says, just validate configurations and make sure that they are um, okay, there's nothing weird in them, there's nothing you know, that's illegal or, or something you don't want, some states you don't want. Um, a very common use case of the validating webhook is in the custom resource definition, or CRD. Um, and when you create a, a CRD, you obviously have your custom um, resource, and there's custom rules as to what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Um, and so you validating webhook, you have the opportunity to, to reject and valid configs. A uh, good example in the Kube Builder uh, book is that they uh, go through how to create a CRD uh, for cron jobs. Um, and so the validating webhook they have there will reject invalid cron configs. A second type of webhook is a mutating webhook. Um, so if you use service meshes like Istio um, or others, they typically deploy some sort of mutating uh, webhook to modify the pod uh, to inject the sidecar in there. Um, and so that, that's the mutating webhook and it's the other common. Um, so what makes webhook so challenging? Um, and I think the first one really is that you have to provide a certificate, a key, as well as a root CA certificate. So you have to provide all three of these pieces of information um, to Kubernetes um, and they all have to be kept up to date, kept fresh, rotated, uh, and it's up to the operator to do that. Uh, the certificate and key have to be saved on disk, which is another challenge. Um, you know, we move towards more in-memory certificates. Uh, the webhook system still requires certificates to be on disk, and that's another challenge, another step in the process. Um, and if anyone knows how to do webhooks without storing stuff on disks, um, I would love to hear how you accomplish that. Uh, and then the root CA certificate has to be provide it into a Kubernetes object, the validating webhook or the mutating webhook configuration um, in the CA bundle field, and you have to keep that up to date. Um, so a sample configuration here is just a validating webhook configuration. It has some sort of name, um, and then you see the CA bundle there uh, field. That's the base64 encoded root CA certificate. Uh, but so as the operator of a webhook, uh, it's your responsibility to keep that up. Um, so how do you manage uh, webhooks currently within Kubernetes? Uh, there's a couple different options. You can use a long-lived certificate. Um, it's a very easy way of getting around the problem. Um, you just have it expire far in the future. Um, we're guilty of doing this as well um, internally. Um, not the best way to do it, but it does work. Um, challenges there is manually 
uh, you have to rotate it manually, but if you keep the expiration date like in the year 3000, probably uh, not a big problem there. Um, but the biggest problem, of course, is that if those certificates leak, it's a security liability, how do you revoke it? Uh, so typically, you don't want long-lived certificates. Um, the standard solution that people use uh, for managing Kubernetes webhooks is Cert Manager. Um, if you follow the Kubebuilder book and the steps they put in there, they have a section on Cert Manager and how to use Cert Manager to manage Kubernetes webhooks. It does the auto-rotation for you, which is great. Um, the problem with Cert Manager, I think, is that it has a lot of overlap with Spire. They're both kind of certificate and management solutions and deploying both, um, I think, um, has a lot of overlap, has a lot of operational overhead. Um, and for us, it was out of scope just because um, the only gap that we had with Spire was the webhook, and we didn't want to deploy Cert Manager. Uh, just purely for the webhook use case, it's a lot of, you know, a new tool to learn, new logs. And so um, we wanted to avoid going down that path. And so the solution that we came up with in working with the Spire team, the contributors and maintainers, is to use Spire uh, to manage um, certificates. And the solution that we have on Spire is based a lot on how Cert Manager does it as well. Uh, so moving forward, how do we actually use Spire to manage those certificates? Um, there's three basic steps that we need to do, and we'll go through them in detail. Uh, the first is that we need to keep that root CA certificate fresh within the validating webhook, mutating webhook configuration, the CA bundled field, so we have to have a way of rotating and maintaining that field. Um, and then, of course, we need to create an entry on the Spire server uh, for the actual webhook pod. The server that's going to be servicing the webhook needs the certificate. Um, in order to get that certificate, it first needs the entry. And then on that pod, we need to actually save that certificate and key um, to disk. Um, so that, those are the three logistical steps. Um, and just to note that this requires Spire 12.2 or later. So that's the, the release of Spire that we got these changes. Okay. Uh, the first part of the solution is keeping the CA bundle fresh. Um, this is actually one of the easier parts of it. Um, and the way we do that is using the Kate's bundle uh, notifier plugin. Um, and so if you're not familiar with this plugin, what it does is it uh, takes the Spire root CA certificate and pushes it into a config map, which then you can use to bootstrap your Spire agent. So if you're not using this, this plugin, uh, you should be. And so what we've done um, is extend this plugin to also, in addition to pushing the root CA certificate to a config map, um, we push that root CA certificate also to the webhook configuration. Um, and so the configuration is um, webhook label, and then the label, or sorry, the name of the label that you want to use. Um, and then what Spire server is going to do is it's going to filter on that label and pods, or sorry, not pods, um, webhook configurations with that label. I um, mean, at Spire will manage the CA bundle field. Uh, so the first box there uh, shows a Spire configuration. Um, so you just specify the actual label you want to use, and then the second box um, with the actual webhook you put in in the label field, um, whatever label you specified, in this case, just spiffyio slash webhook, um, colon true. Um, and then if that is there, uh, when you deploy uh, the validating webhook configuration, you just keep that CA bundle um, field clear. Um, and then once it's deployed, we have a watcher on the Spire server. It filters on that label. So anything with that label, Spire is going to push uh, the root CA certificate into the CA bundle field. Um, it rotates and manages it for you. Um, so whenever the root CA certificate is about to expire, uh, it goes through all the validating webhooks, mutating webhooks uh, that have that label set and rotates the CA bundle for you. Um, and on startup, if you deploy the validating webhook first, once Spire server starts up, it gets a list of everything um, that has that label set um, and populates that. Um, so all you really need to do is just really deploy uh, your webhook with that specific label, um, and then Spire server the rest for you. Um, so that's step one. Um, and so that manages the root CA field within the webhook configuration. Uh, the next thing we need to do is create an entry on the Spire server. Um, there's two ways you can do that. You can just do it manually. You can go onto the Spire server uh, CLI and just do the create entry as you normally would. Uh, the only thing you need to pay attention to is a dash dash uh, DNS, so you need to create a DNS name um, in this specific format, um, the name of the service that you have deployed um, along with the webhook, dot namespace um, that it lives in, dot SVC, 
um, the Kubernetes API server expects that uh, DNS name to be in the certificate. Um, other than that, you know, whatever you create your entry, it can be um, you know, whatever you normally create, um, whether it's pod name, pod UID, whatever it is um, that you need, so as long as the pod um, is associated with that entry. Um, you can also uh, use the Kubernetes workload registrar, um, and that automatically will also add that, that DNS name that's required to the certificate for you. Um, the CRD uh, version of it um, has that configuration enabled by default, so if you deploy that, um, then your pod um, that services the webhook comes up, it'll get the certificate with the correct uh, DNS names in it. Uh, so now you've created the entry. Uh, the most complex part of the, the whole solution is saving the certificate and key to disk. Uh, so there's a lot of code here. Um, um, just first thing to keep in mind, though, is this is just based on uh, the GhostBiffy example, uh, the watcher example, sorry, and the GhostBiffy v2 directory. So what you're doing here is we're creating a watcher uh, that watches for new certificates uh, using the GhostBiffy client. Um, and then when the new certificate comes in, we, we save it to disk. Uh, so the first thing to pay attention here is the imports. I have an import in my, my private GitHub, or not private, public GitHub, uh, that just has some routines, uh, two routines to save to disk. Um, if you don't want to import yet another uh, library, you can just go there and just copy those routines. Uh, that's not, not a lot of code. But in any case, uh, moving forward, um, we create the Go Spiffy uh, client as you normally would. Um, and this first step here, things show up. Uh, so that first block there, um, and then the second block there, we start it using the go function. So that starts uh, the ghost 50 client. And then after we start the ghost 50 client, we wait for certificates to be on disk. Uh, we have to have a barrier there, uh, because if we try to start the webhook server uh, without the certificates in the disk, it throws out an error, and then it crashes and goes into that, or sorry, restart loop. Uh, so you have to make sure the certificates are there on disk. And so I have that in, in my GitHub, there's a little library function that just um, waits for uh, the certificate uh, to be on disk. Um, the wait for certificates to disk function just waits about three minutes. Um, and after three minutes, it times out and gives you an error. Um, and then if the certificates are there, of course, it returns. Okay. Um, so that starts up the ghost Spiffy client. Uh, the thing to keep out for, one more thing to keep out for is this x509 watcher field. Uh, so we're pra passing the directory um, that we're saving the certificates to, um, to the next part of this slide, um, which is uh, the watcher struct. Um, and so if you're familiar with the ghost Spiffy client, um, what happens is that every time that there's a new certificate, um, this on context x509, X, on x509 context update gets called. Um, and so what we're going to do is when that gets called, all we do is just write the uh, actual svid out to disk. Um, and so that's also um, just kind of encapsulated um, in this library function, but it just takes, extracts the default svid um, and then just saves it to um, disk in the directory you specify. Um, the file names are static, tls.crt, tls.key, because um, every um, webhook uh, API that I've seen in Kubernetes just requires it to be on those files, and the only function or only configurability you have is the actual. Um, so you just pass in the directory, and then we save it here um, to those file names and the webhook server to do it. Um, and then once that's all set up, uh, that whole system will then just keep refreshing the certificates on disk for you, um, and then you start your webhook server normally either using the control runtime APIs or whatever other uh, webhook setup that you do. Uh, looking forward, um, I think we need a better way to save certificates to disk. Um, the disk, save to disk use case I think is a little complex one. Um, there's different ways to do it. I think two options here is just um, having GhostBiffy directly save uh, the certificates to disk. Um, if we can't do that, then just have um, export some utilities that I have in my, my GitHub, just have those uh, so in the Go Spiffy library so that the user can then just uh, save the disk. Um, another option that I think would be uh, much more clean and nicely integrated is just to have Spire save the certain key to a Kubernetes secret object, um, and, and your pod uh, mounts that secret object, volume mounts it, and then the certificates will live on disk, because that's how the secrets are mounted. Um, so that would work out nicely, and that would also parallel what the cert manager does. Uh, cert manager 
uh, saves a key and disk um, into a certificate CRD, which is basically a secret object. Um, so it'd be a nice, nice parallel there. Um, also great is uh, API service CI bundle. Um, so we extended the, the plugin uh, from webhooks to API services. So if you're not familiar with API services, it's used to extend the Kubernetes API server uh, with custom API endpoints. Uh, we use this in our product to have some custom metrics endpoints. Uh, but nonetheless, it has also a CA bundle field um, to use for the Kubernetes API server to use. Um, and so um, we added some functionality there um, using the API service label config to the same plugin. Um, and then you just deploy your API service with, with that label, um, and then Spire will manage uh, those certificates for you as well. Um, API services are nice because uh, they don't require certs and keys to be on disk. Uh, so you can use a GoSpiffy TLS peer uh, functionality um, rather than worrying about saving stuff to disk. Uh, if there's any other Kubernetes objects anyone knows about um, that have a CA bundle that needs to be rotated, um, let myself know or open a ticket. Um, we can take a look into that and see if we can add functionality in there as well. Um, and so where all this is coming from is our Nginx service mesh. So that's what we're working on um, at F5. Um, so we embed Spire and deploy it as part of the service mesh. We deploy the Spire server, uh, the agent, and then we use Spire to manage all aspects of identity, um, MTLS, webhook certificates, API service certificates, secure NATs for communication, secure communication, uh, sorry, secure control plane communication, um, we secure um, through NATs using certificates provided uh, by Spire. Uh, so we've built our service mesh um, using Spire as a first-class citizen um, and all of our identity and security through Spire. Um, so that's my um, talk for today. Um, so let me know if you have any questions. Well, I've got one. Uh, you mentioned on the last slide that, that uh, the Nginx service mesh uses Spire for all of its identities. Uh, does that mean that, that you don't run Cert Manager in your Kubernetes clusters, or you run a little of both, or how have you? Good question. No, we don't um, run Cert Manager. Um, and yeah, it was turning out that the only thing that we needed Cert Manager for was that webhook certificate. Um, and yeah, I'm working and getting the, the stuff um, contributed to the Spire code base. Yeah. We just use Spire for. Amazing. Uh, there's a question over there. Questions. Just a simple one, which is, have you done any scale testing with using Spire for doing the CA rotation or creating the CA? Uh, so the question is, have we done any scale testing? Um, no, what kind of scale are you, are you looking at? I'm just one, wondering, based off the way you say it behaves, where when Spire comes up, it then generates CA bundles. I'm wondering how many of those can you do before you get to that three-minute timeout? Oh, so the three-minute the three timeout um, is for just when Spire um, delivers the certificate to the workload. Um, and so that hasn't come up. I mean, that hasn't been a problem for us. Um, the testing that we did was just to see that we put like a short lifetime on the CA bundle, and then to make sure that it keeps, keeps rotating. But we haven't done a whole lot of testing if we have like 5,000 webhooks or anything like that. We haven't tested at that scale. That's a good, definitely a good suggestion, something we should look into. Sh shameless plug on that. Uh, on, on Thursday, I'll be giving a session with, a, with a, another community member on scaling Spire to 1 million nodes. And they're running Kubernetes. So if you have questions like this, I highly recommend you attend that session. Great question, though. Any others? Online or in person? Let me go ahead and say no. If any questions come in on the platform after the fact, we'll just drop them in Slack. Thank, Thank you, you again, Faisal. This was awesome.